Hello there. Welcome to the booth here at the World Magic Cup. Marshall Sutcliffe with Luis Scott Vargas. And we're heading into round two action early in the day. We've got Team Limited here. It's Team Sealed. Players have opened 12 booster packs of Kaladesh. Got those separated into three different decks, and they're ready to do battle. And we've got another great one for you lined up here. No big surprise. With 72 countries, we're going to be able to pick some pretty great ones in the early stages here. But we've got uh, Team Germany versus Team Brazil down in the feature match area. And it sounds like they're ready to go. All righty. You want to go down there? Let's go. All right. Let's head down for round two here from the World Magic Cup. Hello and welcome to coverage of the World Magic Cup. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Louis Scott Vargas and we are all set for round two action here. This is Team Sealed. We've got Germany versus Brazil. You got for a second there, you got a chance to see our German player Mark Tobias. He's playing against, well, Paulo Vitor Dominarosa. You take a look at him right there from Brazil and uh, they are sitting both in the middle seat uh, that's the B seat, as it were. And, of course, their teammates are going to be playing on the left and right of them in the A and the C. So let's get underway here, Luis. Um, I had a chance to take a look at the deck looks really quickly here. And it looks like we're going to see perhaps a bit of a slugfest. We've got red-black versus black-white here in our first round. You're going to see a decent amount of red-black or red-white decks. And, uh, you know, we saw both red, black, and red, white represented last round. You see red, black here again. Just th these, this aggressive color pairing makes a lot of sense because you don't take a lot of the cards that the control decks want. So Paulo gets to play a deck he's very comfortable with. Also, he, he definitely likes the aggressive red decks in this format. Yeah, he just, he's all about the, like here, the Weldfast monitors and the spider side infiltrators. infiltrators. He just loves it. He's really found his rhythm with those type of cards, and it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because the th theoretically, the white-black deck should be favored, all things being equal, because they can transition to a more controlling route easier than the, uh, the black-red deck. Right. A card like uh, Glint Sleeve Artisan is great on offense or defense, whereas Spire Side Infiltrator eh, it lacks a little bit on defense. We saw that Paulo kind of forced the issue. He activated his Weldfast monitor, giving it menace, attacked, and Mark said, okay, fine, it's a one-for-one, one. my three-drop for your three-drop, I'll double block, and it actually worked. Yeah, and, and a big reason why Mark would do that as well is he's got very good late-game cards uh, in his deck, like... Hey, an Ether Storm Rock right on time there for you, Luis, and uh, that is the type of card that can overpower what Paulo's doing, especially, especially given that Mark is sitting at a nice 20 life, though Welding Sparks does have something to say about that. And he's going to send that Aether Storm rat Rock packing, though Paulo still with no good attacks, unwilling to trade off his uh, Infiltrator for the lowly 2-2 there. Uh, right when I saw that Aether Storm Rock hit the uh, graveyard, Luis, it made me think of one card. Do you know what it is? Uh, I, I think That's I not that one. <laughs> but uh, that one's pretty good, too. Angel of Invention for Mark Tobias here. And he's really asked a very... Urgent question of uh, Paulo. Do you, do you have an answer for this? In, in making Angel, you know, fabricate itself two plus plus one counters instead of making two servos is a little bit risky against a red black deck, which has access to a lot of removal spells, but much higher payoff if it works out. And uh, looks like it's working out quite well, especially given that uh, Mark just drew a uh, rush of vitality, so he's going to be able to protect Angel from almost anything Paulo could muster. Pretty much anything. Any die youngs over there? Not that I can see. Yeah, so it, this is going to be pretty tough for Paulo to... Is we're going to see Mark just keep that mana up for the rest of the game. The card, of course, I was referring to earlier, though, uh, was Restoration Gearsmith out of this black-white deck. It's the type of card that you can play to get back a bomb. Uh, he doesn't have any in his deck, though. He does have a Fortuitous Find in, in hand right now, and th that's the kind of card that... I would expect to see a slightly more often in Team Sealed if you if you expect to play maybe more drawn out games against other powerful decks. And when you have cards like Angel Invention and Ether Storm Rock, that is a very uh, enticing card to play. All right, and now we do see Paulo finally make a move here. He has chump blocked with his Foundry Screecher, but he is setting up to at least get Sure Strike to finish things off here. 
But that rush of vitality, good enough yeah, to save the angel of invention here. And, and Paul sequenced that such that he, he chump blocked, presumably, and then end of turn went for the subtle strike. So the rush of Vitality didn't gain Mark the extra point of life, but it still worked out for Mark. It saved the Angel, and while that Angel's in play, there, it's very unlikely Paulo's going to be able to make any headway. It's just, you know, an eight-point life swing a, a turn, gaining four and dealing four to Paulo. Yeah, interestingly, Mark did think about what his options were, because with that Fortuitous fine in his hand, he can also just buy back that Angel at some point. Yeah, what Mark really wants to do is have one of these Eager Constructs die and then be able to Fortuitous fine back Ether Storm Rock and Eager Construct, you know, getting yeah. both targets there. And he certainly offered for that to happen, attacking with the either eager construct for it offering a trade, but uh, Paulo did not oblige him. And now we see some of the weaknesses of the aggro decks that you'll see sometimes in Team Sealed, where you can really build a, a good curve. The top decks that Paulo Vitor Domitorosa has access to are subpar. Yeah, thri Thriving Grub's not the card you want on turn six or seven. Yeah, and as it turns out, that's actually the game going to mark Tobias, so he is going to uh, pick up game one for Team Germany there, defeating the Brazilian and really, you know, one of the best players that's ever played Magic, uh, Paulo Vitor Domitorosa, though he's still going to have to pick up at least another game to get that match for his team. We will be back after these messages. Looking for a place to try out new decks and strategies? Head to your local game store and check out Friday Night Magic. Get more info at wizards.com slash FNM. Kaladesh is now available on Magic Duels. Build endless deck combinations with more than 1,000 unique cards. Play through hours of story with 50 campaign missions. Play Magic Duels free today on Xbox One, Steam, iPad, and iPhone. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Rotterdam. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I've got Luis Scott Vargas with me, and we are going to transition over to table A, which is the one that's nearest to us on the camera. That's Patrick Dickman versus Tiago Saparito. And you can see we are right in the thick of game one here, as Tiago looks like he's behind Dickman, applying a lot of pressure here. A night market lookout. A spire side infiltrator, that's a lot of incidental damage with any vehicles, and it looks like he's got two of them on the battlefield here. It's hard to imagine that Tiago's going to survive much more of this. Tiago's playing an interesting build here, Luis. He's got blue-black, which I, I'll admit is not a color combo that I thought we'd see much of from the uh, Team Sealed event. It's not uh, one that you do see very frequently, but uh, I was actually watching Team Brazil build, and the the fact that they, one of their best cards in blue is Torrential Gear Hulk uh. really gave them incentive to pair it with black so you get access to the two tidy conclusions, and you have these really powerful instants to, to flash back with the Gear Hulk. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out for Tiago that time. That was Patrick Dickmon picking up game one, which means that uh, we're going to be moving back to uh, Mark Tobias versus Paulo Vitor Damodorosa. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds like uh, we had a, a bit of a flurry of a finish back on our back table there as well. Dennis Nolte from Germany made some big elephants, it sounds like. He had a terror, a terror of the fairgrounds or... Yeah, with uh, Larger Than Life. Not elephants at all. <laughs> Gremlins. <laughs> That's crazy. All right, well, let's get underway here. Back on Paulo Vitor Damodrosa versus Mark Tobias as uh, they get started here. A nice aggressive start for Paulo. He's got the sky skiff, though. Unfortunately for him, no infiltrator that turn to uh, get it into the sky. He, in fact, he has another vehicle. He could be a little vehicle flooded here, Luis. He, he could also be normal flooded. Uh, if you take a look at uh, Paulo's hand here. Oh, no. It's three swamps and a mountain he just drew off the bone. Oh, no. Barge. So the, the upside of this for Paulo is that any creature he draws puts him into a very good spot because he's already got Mark down to 15. He's got a Foundry's creature pressuring. And any creature can crew the Sky Skiff. And a lot of creatures can crew the Bizarre Barge, which would give Paulo some pretty substantially uh, good attacks. <laughs> Another mountain. Jeez. You almost could feel it, too, the way he shuffled his cards. Like, come on. Remember, Paulo lost game one. We were here on our first match there. You can take a look at Mark. Mark's the, the second most experienced player on Team Germany. Patrick Dickmann has about twice as many pro points lifetime as Mark. But Mark, you know, is somebody you'll see at the Pro Tour frequently. So Paulo, <coughs> with not much to work with in hand as far as spells go, he has nothing to cast. So he is going to try to make a race out of this. He's going to use his Foundry Screecher to crew up the Bizarre Barge and send it in for five. These are big chunks of damage. Mark is already down to ten, but you just have to feel with spells and lands in hand for Mark that he's going to be able to uh, navigate this game unless Paulo can come up with something very powerful very quickly. Also, right as I say that, I think he's got that Angel Invention in his hand again. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, he's got, he's like got a Wisp Weaver Angel, but let's take a look at his hand here. Sky Swirl, Harrier, Rush of Vitality, Essence Extraction. So no, there is no Angel of, uh, of Invention, but a nice hand nonetheless. Oh, an Essence Extraction is exactly the card you want when your opponent's trying to uh, pressure your life total and, and finish you off before Flood catches up to them, which is really what Paul is doing. In fact, Paul drew an, an excellent draw there. Uh, PNLR can crew potentially both vehicles de depending on uh, how much mana Paulo has and what, what creatures he wants to use. Interesting. Yeah, I'm curious to see as well. Mark decided this turn that he was not going to use the essence extraction proactively to make sure that Paulo couldn't crew a vehicle. He could have cast it on his own turn and said, okay, Paulo, you have to come up with a creature right away. He didn't. And I think part of the logic there is that if Paulo doesn't play another creature this turn, then Mark is in great shape. And if Paulo does, then he's going to have more options which to crew the vehicle anyway, so might as well plan for the, the situation which is going to be harder to win, which is when Paulo has a creature. It just gives you, Mark more options as to what he can use his essence extraction on. Yeah, how much do you think Mark knows about what's going on in Paulo's hand, by the way? I mean, Paulo passed with five lands last turn, did nothing. So if, Paulo, if I was Mark and I, and I saw Paulo pass with five lands, two vehicles in play, really wants to crew them, I, the only thing I, I would get to was that Paulo has tidy conclusion. That's what I'd think, too. And not, and, or maybe a combat trick. But then Paulo didn't play anything end of turn with five mana. So that basically rules out tidy conclusion. You can't not use five mana when you have the option. As, as tough as it is, I, I would have just put Paulo on either all lands or all lands in like one combat trick. Okay. So he will at least have some awareness that Paulo probably drew PNLR for the turn here. And Paulo is going to go ahead and get that Sky Skiff crude. attack for five in the air, and he's going to also activate Pia Nalar here on the Sky Skiff. This is a decent opening for Mark, yes, and he is going to use the Essence Extraction to take down the Foundry's creature, which is going to leave him even on life total. He gained three, he also lost three from the Skiff, so he just stays at ten. Yeah, negating the attack there uh, is... You know, all you can ask for, especially since e even though Paulo's flooded, Pia was just a, a very good draw. She yeah. provides multiple creatures to crew vehicles with, a mana sink when you're on, about to be on seven lands in play. But Paulo does have to worry about his own life total. Hey, that was point. half of it disappearing yeah. right here, Louise. He's going from 14 to 7. Oval Chase Daredevil, it's a, a card that can apply some pressure. 
Absolutely. And here's we're going to see kind of a defensive Wispweaver Angel as well. He's going to be able to, to blink either of his creatures, therefore untapping them. Maybe if he uses the Glint Sleeve Artisan, he can even make a 1-1 one, one servo rather than the, the counter. It's exactly what he's going to do. And he just went from having no blockers to having three. Wispweaver is really nice because... It doesn't completely stop the Sky Skiff because of PNLR, but it does make it so you can at least trade for Sky Skiff and four mana. And then making the 1 1 servo means that Beaumont Bazaar Barge has to run over the servo before it starts getting into Mark's life total. And that, that'll presumably give Mark enough time to start attacking back with the, you know, the Daredevil for additional damage and, and, and trying to race here. Okay, well, here's a Mal Malphus Doorbuster from Paulo. going to pass the turn back here to uh, Mark. Mark's still with plenty of action in hand. He's got that Sky Swirl Harrier at the ready. And it looks like he's doing a little math trying to figure out, well, what does my attack actually look like here? This Rush of Vitality is going to be amazing. It, it, it's the sort of card that you want in this situation because Paul is going to be obliged to block at some point and Rush will just make it so the, the game will no longer be a race. It'll be whether Paulo can, can stabilize with Mark's life total being almost unreachably high if he's able to gain a, you know, a solid chunk of five life here. Yeah, it's pretty tough for, for Paulo because when you look at things from that perspective, you know, Paulo, given that he's drawn a lot of lands, has switched gears and said, I need to take a risky line that lets me get in for as much damage as I can. And the way to punish that is, like you said, to gain life. And that, that would be three life from the essence extraction earlier, plus another, you know, four to six here, four to five here is going to really make it tough for Paulo. It, it, if Mark gains eight life over the course of this game where Paulo's working with, you know, not a lot, it's going to make it really tough for him. Yeah. Paulo's draw is capable of dealing 20 or 21 damage a lot more than it is capable of dealing 29 damage. He, he just does not have enough gas. Now, this is kind of, kind of interesting, though, for, for Mark. He did attack with the uh, Oval Chase Daredevil. It got blocked by the Bizarre Barge, and Paulo just said okay and then mark said all right and it went away so it didn't actually work out that well for him he decided not to use the rush and one reason you wouldn't use rush of vitality there is that the daredevil will come back as soon as mark uses that like acrobatic maneuver in hand to blink glint sleeve artisan make a servo return oval chase daredevil to hand yeah so mark just not that worried about it he's just not that worried about it and on top of it look at the situation here he's got two lethal threats in the air that uh, must be blocked. And Paulo, while he does have blockers for both, they're both chump blocks. It's going to be very tough for Paulo to get in for the full 10 here as he's really forced to try it, right? Uh, he knows that if he just sits here, next turn he can chump block twice and survive, but that's just not a winning game for him. What does he have? Looks like an ambitious Etherborn. Okay. Normally be a pretty reasonable draw at this point. It does double crew the vehicles, and that combined with Malfus Doorbuster to, to make it harder on Mark blocking. Yeah. Plus PNLR, Paulo's not quite there on, on Lethal, but he's very close. He's very close. Well, and he's really forcing Mark to have a card like Rush well, actually, of Vitality he can, here, he, right? He can Doorbuster that the Sky Swar Hero, sack both of the 1-1s. One can he make it so he can't block anything? And he can make it so all his creatures get through. So the Ambitious Either One actually is going to let Paulo steal this game. Because he, he, he now he has lethal now because and Mark's not able to block anything, so oh. Rush of Vitality doesn't do it. Wow! So if Mark Tobias would have used his rush, for example, on that prior attack, he put have, could have put himself out of range. Oh, not only would Mark and have taken been out five the higher life, barge. the Bizarre Barge would have died, okay. and Paulo was able to use multiple not blocking abilities to to make it so none of Mark's <laughs> creatures got into combat, and the rush didn't do anything. Wow! I cannot believe that Paulo just stole that game. It looked. so so bad from turn two. <laughs> you know, when we came in, he had just played land number four, played the Bizarre Barge, looking for any action he could get, and whiffed. And he somehow stole that game. Incredible stuff from Paulo Vitor Dominarosa. I mean, we do expect it from him, <laughs> you know, as a whole. He, he doesn't have 10 Pro Tour top eights by accident. Right. Unreal. Okay, well, that means that we get to pop in and take a look back on uh, table A here, where we've got Patrick Dickmon versus. Tiago Saparito and the ideal turn one open here for Digmon. He's got Night Market Lookout. Yeah, oh, it, thankfully, he doesn't have a Nightmare Lash. Well, it's quite a nightmare for Tiago, actually. It, it absolutely is. Turn one, it is going to give him a lashing. <laughs> <laughs> turn one night, uh, night Market Lookout represents, you know, two damage a turn, uh, uh, one of which is uh, actually gains a life for Patrick, and then 
Tiago actually found an answer just a, a turn too late. He did. Yeah, this is really interesting, but that yeah, is still gonna a be fantastic good. answer here to the board state that, that Patrick has put forth. Because it means that really Patrick's going to be forced to find a removal spell if he wants to keep the damage flowing. Now, if he does... You know, God forbid if he has a unlicensed disintegration here, it could just be over, right? Just kill that, hit you for five, you take three off of the disintegration. Contra and Kingpin's a uh, very powerful card. It's great in the early game, great in the late game, and that's one of the cards that's really making this blue-black deck work. But Patrick has, a, has a, a multiple ways to kind of get around that. It looks like Tiago declined to block here as well. And another follow-up play from Patrick Dickman. He's got the Spireside Infiltrator. And, you know, the really scary part, if you're sitting in Tiago's seat, is that if Patrick finds a vehicle, now he has a steady stream of two damage a turn that he can just repeat without even having to attack. Yeah, the, the combination of when this becomes tapped and vehicles, you know, obviously a natural one, and a deck that wants either Night Market Lookout or Spireside Infiltrator frequently wants the other. You and we saw Patrick with uh, multiple vehicles in play game one. You can see Contraband Kingpin here. Scry a couple of times thanks to the uh, Weapon Craft Enthusiast there. Looks like he did find something to keep on top. Another update, by the way, uh, from our table C. They're going to game three. So that was uh, Patrick Fernandez forcing game three against uh, Dennis Norte. So yes, yes, this one is shaping up quite nicely. We've got two game threes on both table B and C as we Keep an eye on table A here on their second game. Land number four for Dickmon has finally arrived. Let's see what he can do with it. Oh, he's got a, a great suite of options here. Uh, looks like Built to Smash and uh, and Welding Sparks mean that Patrick can Welding Jeez. Sparks away the Contraband Kingpin, attack with everything, and then Built to Smash to save the Night Market Lookout. Or he could just not even risk the Night Market Lookout and then essentially trade Built to Smash for, for uh, some Servo Tokens. All right, well, he's going to get some value out of Built to Smash. Now, he's going to have to worry. Now, well, it looks like he wasn't worried about it at all. He's just going to go for the Built to Smash. But a Select for Inspection could have been pretty awkward for him. There's only spell that really mattered. But Tiago doesn't have it. Yeah, and this Renegade Freighter is going to work out so well because, as Jeez. you mentioned, it's going to start getting crewed by Night Market Lookout and uh, Spireside Infiltrator end of turn, dealing two damage to Tiago. And then next turn, it'll threaten to attack for five. It also adds a second artifact to the board to make this Welding Sparks uh, slightly more powerful. So, things not looking great for Tiago. Even, it's weird to say that after he just cast a Gear Seeker Serpent, you know, which is traditionally the play that he's kind of building up to in a control deck like this. But honestly, it may just not be enough if Dickmon can put this together. And, you know, Patrick, he loves playing Affinity in modern i wouldn't be surprised to see him play that uh later in the tournament here um this has a similar feel in the sense that like he's using these sort of underpowered smaller creatures to eke out damage every single damage mattering and uh and right now he's just in a good spot on board yeah night market lookout is not a card you casually put in your deck you know you, you have a purpose for that card so let's see what patrick comes up with here is he just going to pump the brakes he's got a doomed operative and but wait there's more an emerald bruiser but yeah he's just going to pass the turn back and he's just like you know tiago you have to deal with what i have here because in five turns you're dead if you do nothing and the dune operative doing a really good job of holding back the serpent you know because if the game plan for tiago is i'm going to just tap all my mana and make my serpent unblockable that's not going to work either no especially with the life gain from the the lookout the lookout yeah i mean patrick digmon and his aggro decks now at 24 <laughs> getting a bunch of life Ooh, but make obsolete. That was a nice one there for Saparito. He got the Emerald Bruiser, but more importantly, the Night Market Lookout. So that is going to help him extend his clock significantly as the Spireside Infiltrator is going to be able to do one damage a turn. But, uh, you know, when you're sitting on eight, it gives you a lot of time to find some answers. Yeah, that, that was pretty key for, for Tiago since now at least he, he isn't, isn't dead just immediately. But that Welding Sparks is just threatening to, to eventually take out Gear Seeker Serpent if, yeah. if Patrick can find another artifact. And at, at that point, the floodgates will open. Let's see what Patrick has for us here this turn. Great start to the game for him. He's already up a game, and he just needs to finish off this one game here to defeat Tiago and give Team Germany one match towards the good. 
another renegade freighter. Wow, now that Gear Seeker Serpent's doing pretty good work here, holding back a pair of trains. Yeah, I, su I suspect that Patrick is setting up for the welding sparks on the Serpent, at which point he can start sending in freighters, though self-assembler does make that a little less enticing because now you're just going to trade your freighter for a self-assembler every turn. Yeah. That still might add up to enough damage, especially with Spireside Infiltrator. Smart play by Saparito there as well. You saw that he knew already that it was on the bottom of his library. He'd put it there with a contraband kingpin, knowing that he could get it back later. He didn't want to have it stuck in his hand. <laughs> Interesting. Tiago did not have the select for inspection that one turn, but I think he does now. He keeps leaving up that one island, which looks a little ominous. Let's take a look here. Looks like a Jinjit sentry. Oh, it's a sentry. Yeah, I saw it wrong then. Six. Apologies. All right, but that Renegade Freighter does get him up to three artifacts. Three plus three equals six, so down goes the Gear Seeker Serpent. And that's going to clear the way for some uh, crewing here, it looks like. And so now if you send in the two 5-4 tramples, getting the Scrappy Scrounger in the mix seems pretty good, even though it, 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 it gets uh, blanked by Self-Assembler. That prevents Self-Assembler from blocking one of the Renegade Freighters. Tiago Saparito at six life. He is fighting to hang on. Now, he certainly has powerful top-end option in his, in his list here. But this is really tough. Remember, the, the trains both get bigger and have trample on the attack here. I mean, Tiago is falling, you know, to two on this attack. And with a Spireside Infiltrator in play, that's not a very good life total to be at. Just the, the trample of Renegade yeah. Freighter is just so hard to deal with here. One of the Freighters does get traded off but unfortunately for tiago his board is now gone and he may need to see a torrential gear hulk or something along that level immediately even then it might not be enough yeah, he no. found padim and padim does not get the job done tiago extends the hand and patrick dickmon wins the first match here for team germany so he wins two games to zero, which means that our pair of game threes on our other two tables are going to be the determining factors here. As you see, Patrick immediately jumping ship here to go help out his teammate. All right, let's jump back to our main table. This is the one that we started on. And this is Paulo Vitor Damodorosa on the right-hand side of your screen versus Mark Tobias on the left. And... Uh, White black versus red black. Let's see who can uh, who can win this. I still can't believe that Paulo stole that game. It looked so good for Mark. He had to see, he had to take lethal damage, staring at a card that could gain him five life. It's just the most miserable spot. But uh, Paulo found the win. Yeah, by by making it so none of Mark's creatures could block, preventing three of them from blocking in the same turn. Paulo's able to sneak in uh, enough damage there. Yeah. All scroungers all the time here down in the future match area here for Team it's a great Sealed. Card. <laughs> it is very solid, especially in these aggressive decks. And it's even better in Team Sealed because you can build these curve based decks so much better. It's hard to in draft. They always kind of drift a little more towards the mid range, whether you wanted them to or not, but not in Team Sealed. Trusty Companion. He's got a Robo Dog <laughs> and a Meaty Dog here. In the meantime, Scrap Heap Scrounger, as it does, just gets sent into the red zone. Can't block anyway. If it has any possible trades, you just send it in. You see Paulo's deck very set up for aggression. He's got two three-power creatures, one with evasion, one that just can't block, and he really doesn't want to spend his time you know, on the defensive. So, so the fact that uh, Mark got on the board first is pretty relevant, though. This turn, not, hmm. not, not, not as impressive. Yeah, that may signal that he just doesn't have anything else to do. It also may signal that he's digging for lands. And yeah, Mark's going to go for the value line here. He's going to use his aviary mechanic to pick up that metal spinner's puzzle knot, which lets him cast it again and draw another card off of it. He can sacrifice it later on if he'd like. Now... That isn't free, right? I mean, he is facing a very aggressive deck from Paulo and giving up, you know, a life total here and a life total there while spending two mana to, you know, on a, on a oh, not yeah. blocker can, can catch up to you. But we all have also seen that Mark's list has the ability to gain life, and, and that could be pretty important. So Paulo does have Furious Reprisal in hand, it looks like, and that gives him the option of uh, taking out any two of Mark's creatures. So the question is, does Paulo want to attack first not caring about Scrap Heap Scrounger dying. 
God, that is savage. Especially, again, you know, after Mark had spent a little bit of mana here, a little bit of mana there, not doing much, he just clears the way for six damage with one card and really shores up this board state. Now, there's a Mercata Pillar Bug off the top for Mark. Like we said, he does have ways to gain life and get back in this. And this is the kind of game where the fact that Mark's turn four was spend four mana for a 2-2 two -two and, and, you know, draw a card and, and lose a life. It's just not as impressive as what Paulo spent four mana on. Just that extra card advantage that Mark was getting. Great in the long game, less good when both players are curving out. See that Paulo also has a uh, fateful showdown in his hand. You know, there are very few ways to do damage directly to your opponent in this format. You know, yeah. there's no lightning axe or anything like that. But Faithful Showdown does. And it is one way that you can steal a win uh, from players who are not really thinking about that as one of the options on how they might lose the game. So we'll keep an eye on that and see if it ends up being a big factor. Mark, though, is going to use... The Metal Spinner's puzzle not to draw a card, hit his land drop, and then revoke the privileges of the Scrounger, hopefully just keeping that thing at bay for the rest of this game. Now, in the meantime, he's still taking what ultimately are big chunks of damage in the air from this Screecher. Yeah, and that, and that fateful showdown means that Paulo's not that many hits away from, from winning. One. It, it, especially given that he's got another Foundry Screecher in hand, he could very easily set up uh, a situation where Mark needs to answer both Foundry Screechers or die to fateful showdown. Yes. You know, you have to figure that Mark has some type of answer for this creature. Now, the second one is going to be a surprise to him, but he did not, you know, he could have left back his construct to block the scrounger and sort of set that loop into motion slowly for a while, and he didn't. So I would assume that Mark has some way to interact with the foundry screecher here. Here's the best way. Ooh, he does indeed. Yeah, essence, essence extraction. extraction is going to buy him a lot of time. And then the pillar bug to give him yeah, some hope that, of coming, that actually, climbing back in. That actually is exactly what Mark needed because wow. it deals with the, the lethal threat and then uh, makes it so Fateful Showdown is no, is no longer just lethal. Yes. Now, he doesn't know about the Fateful Showdown, but if he would not have made that exact sequence of gaining the life while killing one of the creatures, he would just would have been dead. Yeah, it was, it was a tough turn. To, for Paul to imagine Mark stabilizing without something like Essence Extraction, but Essence Extraction will do it in one shot. Right. I mean, it's so close that, like, if Mark had been, like, Die Young, Picard yeah. a Pillar Bug, he would have lost. So the key here is that if that Pillar Bug gets a hit in, it buys Mark another turn. But there's a chance that he doesn't he doesn't want to trade it off. The the downside for Paulo, though, is because Malphus Doorbuster is so good at eliminating blockers, that pillar bug is almost forced to attack. Right. Y you can't leave it back and just get, you know, door busted. Interestingly here, it's a tough decision, though, for Mark. Uh, he's really been content to just keep on attacking here, but this feels risky now with this construct. He may want to leave it back. Th the interesting thing, though, Luis, is that he's got exactly six mana, and he has in his hand a Wisweaver Angel. So yeah. he can reset that as a blocker if he wants to just chip in for two. Um, the problem is that he can't activate the pillar bug and cast the uh, Wisp Weaver Angel as well. So uh, what what Mark you know, may, may be looking to set up is that angel, like you said. That'll give Paul the opportunity to Malphus Doorbuster, make the angel unable to block, getting three damage in with Foundry's Creature, and then using Fateful Showdown. And I think, I think that Paul is going to do that. I think so too, because here we go. The Wisp Weaver Angel is going to reset the Pillar Bug to give him the most amount of blockers he can have, three of them, but Paulo is going to door bust the Flyer. That's going to get in for three. And we'll go through the motions here, but Paulo has enough cards left in hand. He's got four total, one of them being Fateful Showdown. Do Boom. three to your head, and he's going to have to discard these, but that's game. Paulo Vitor Tomato Rosa steals game two and, uh, you know, kind of methodically worked through game three to take his match for Team Brazil. So that means that we've got Patrick Dickmon having won his versus Thiago Saparito. Paulo Vitor Dama Rosa narrowly defeats Mark Tobias, and that means that it's Dennis Nolte versus Patrick Fernandez. Game three for the round. Yep, this, this will determine the winner of this round. And, man, if you're Paulo, you almost feel like you're living on borrowed time still. He, he stole game two. He knows he stole game two. You know, Mark knows he stole game two. Right. And... That, that, that means that if Brazil does end up walking away with this match, Paul's going to feel pretty good about that sequence of events. No kidding.
And that is kind of one of the things that needs to happen, right? You know, they always people always say you need to run well to, to win a tournament or to, to put a deep run in, in a tournament. That that's part of the deal, right? You kind of steal a game, you get away with something and run it up. Well, I mean, if you think about it, at the beginning, your your you know your your win share is fifty percent. You should win fifty percent of your matches. So every, to get the percentage above fifty. You know, you have to play. You have to play as well as you can. You have to hope your opponents uh, sometimes make mistakes, and that that is what is how you get to a win percentage of you know in the mid sixty percent, which is you know that that is world class. Like if you can right. w- win sixty four percent of your matches, you are an elite player. And Paulo Paulo has gotten there by winning matches like the one we just saw. By the way, this is a, a pretty nice sequence here for Dennis. He had the turn one animation module, and then y- the only thing you want at that point is some type of creature to put a plus one, plus one counter on, and he had that with the Thriving Grubs. Yeah, and it's a n- nice little combo that you know makes animation module c- kind of the bomb that it is. It, it, it's, it's a card you have to build around, but it is worth it when you do. Absolutely. He does have enough mana to activate it. It costs three. Ideally, you have four mana so that you can make the servo that you get, you know, kind of for free when you activate it. But even this already is putting pressure on. And Patrick had one of the most beefy two drops in the format. He had a two three on turn three, and it's not good enough. Another thriving grubs here for Dennis. Gives him perhaps from an, an insurance policy. Again, the thing that you don't want to happen is that you don't have any creatures with plus one plus one counters because then that module doesn't do anything anymore. Module is really tough to figure out at first, right? Yeah, it, the, it's a weird card. All the modules were uh, it was a little unclear exactly where they fit in, but it turns out they're just great in this in this format. All of yeah. them, and animation module is you know, generally regarded as being the best. Yeah, it turns out that's there's a reason why that's the rare one. Yep. So no play there. Sure. So last turn from Patrick. Dennis did not pay, spend one to make a servo when he uh, attacked with Thriving Grubs, and there's basically two reasons that that he, he that, that's how that would have played out. Uh, one is that he's, and you know the more common one is that he's leaving man up for a green combat trick, or at least wants to represent it. The other is, is that he missed the trigger, you know, or, or did you know didn't see that that was an option, and Patrick has to now decide. You know which of those it is. I think he just missed it. That, that's what it looks like. But it, from it, Patrick's side of the board, mm-hmm. you, you you the first oh, you're thinking blossoming defense. Yeah, or the, the, the ornamental courage. The yeah. first the first thing I would put my opponent on is that because that is more likely. But you know if if Dennis doesn't play a trick here, then we you know the the truth may be revealed. Yeah, the thing about animation module is that it says whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are placed on a permanent, it triggers. But the thinking on it is is that you pay three, tap it, make an additional counter, and then you're like, oh, I'll pay the four, I'll pay the extra mana to make it, but it actually does trigger any time you get a counter for any reason, not just from itself. It looks like the German team decided they were okay with the trade there rather than activating the module and taking on a little bit of extra risk. Yeah, so they could have paid three and put another counter on the, the blocked Thriving Grubs. They would have let it defeat the Seed Sculptor without dying, but against a green-white deck with three mana untapped and six cards in hand, yeah, seems like a pretty, pretty risky play to make. Agreed. So they're going to just let that happen, especially given that they already have a Thriving Grubs to keep putting counters on. In the meantime... Patrick from Team Brazil here has played a Pima Outrider. Um, not sure if he's going to make a servo or put a plus one plus one counter on it yet, but either way, a nice solid four drop addition that actually is going to help him stabilize the board. But we're going to see Dennis activate that animation module on end step, putting another counter on the Thriving Grubs, and then he'll have the mana to do it again here. And it gets out of hand very quickly. Well, on turn three, that actually was a good reason to not make a servo. Is oh, the, the, what is the, the, the timing was such that if he made the servo, we actually wouldn't be able to activate the module. And so that actually made combat go better for him. So that is an, actually another good reason not, oh, not sure. to use animation module. That makes sense. Now that he's leaning more into the activated ability, since Dennis actually hasn't played very many spells this game. He's only played the two grubs and, and the module, like, despite seeming like he has a lot of action because the, the module creates so many possibilities. And <laughs> speaking of possibilities, the, the, the whole team is, is you know, ready and, and, and willing to offer advice here. It is interesting to see how different players react to that as well. Uh, you know, you'll normally see the stronger players helping out the, the less strong players, but... Uh, when you do, some people take advice very freely, and others get flustered. You yeah. know, they, they don't get mad, but it just can start to pile up a little bit. 
All right, so here's Harness Lightning now for Dennis. Energy, and he's going to just go ahead and pay the three energy to take down the Pima Outrider, leaving Patrick with sure. just a servo. And that's going to put Patrick very much on the defensive here, especially since Dennis has been able to play, you know, somewhat efficient cards and, you know, put a lot of pressure on Patrick where he's, Patrick's playing one spell per turn. And remember, Patrick didn't play anything on turn three. That's an important turn to skip in, in a game that does not look like it's going to be very long. Now, one interesting thing that can happen here, Dennis is going to go ahead and use his, his module to make the grubs big. But if Patrick has a way to kill the thriving grubs, and I don't mean keep it on the board, kill it like revoke privileges. I mean, get it out of here. Then he will have shut down Dennis Nolte's entire game plan. And, you know, the module doesn't do anything if you don't have creatures with plus one, plus one counters around. I mean, right now, Team Germany is leaning very hard on a thriving grubs. <laughs> Pretty funny that Patrick has five cards in hand, but because he doesn't have double white, he can't play area responder. Hunt the weak and blossom <laughs> defense require a creature in play. And then uh, not, impeccable, not so impeccable, impeccable time. timing, not big <laughs> enough to take the grubs. And then Wisp Weaver costs six. Patrick has five cards in hand and essentially has zero. None of the cards do anything right now. It's really hard to assemble a hand like this, but wow. they, they managed to get there. You could see it on the face of the Brazilian team there, too. They're kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do here? And as it turns out, their life total is falling away very quickly to this Thriving Grubs. It might just be too late. You know, once once you get into chump block mode where you're like, okay, Wisp Weaver, we finally did it, and you just have to chump block with it. Well, it's not going to work out very well. Yeah, and for those asking about uh, advice in, in, in teams, part of the strength of teams is that you, you can get advice from your teammates. And, you know, uh, Marshall, like you mentioned, being able to take advice and give advice well is part of the skill of team competitions. Forrest is, a, is a one of the more mocking draws wow, I can think of. Wow, and he just has to throw his hands in the air, and that is Team Germany clapping and saying, what did you have in your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I could cast. Team Germany defeats Brazil here in the second game to improve to 2-0. Oh. Brazil going to take their first loss pretty early in the tournament. They are, though, one of the more powerful teams out in the field. Tiago Saparito and uh, Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa headlining that team as two you know, platinum-level players that we see quite a bit out of the Pro Tour yeah. as well. Welcome back to the booth here, Marshall Cycle for Luis Scott Vargas, as we work our way through the early stages of the day here at the World Magic Cup in Rotterdam. It's been great. You know, this We don't get to see a lot of teams sealed. You know, last weekend we had a GP in Rotterdam here in the same city uh, that was this format, and, and now we get to see well, it is Rotterdam yeah, hogging all the team sealed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rotterdam's a nice city, though, yeah, to be fair. They, they do deserve it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all right. But that is going to do it for round two. We'll be back after these messages.
Welcome back to the news desk. Rich Hagen, your host here at the World Magic Cup in Rotterdam. Round two is winding down. As you can see on your screens, about 10 minutes left in the round. Our reporter, Brian David Marshall, is out on the floor looking at all the matches that are still going. One of those, they lost their first round, so we're going to head out and see how the two Hall of Famers are doing. What's happening with Team Japan, BDM? Uh, you know, Rich, I am all the way in the furthest corner of the hall. We saw Team Japan lose last round. They are playing right now in game three of the third match of the round against Team Lithuania. Captain Gudinis Vidigiris looking on as his teammate plays against Toru Takashida. Takashida has a thriving Rhino in play. He just played a bristling Hydra. On Lithuania's side of the table, you see a world fast monitor. You see a thriving Grubs with a plus one, plus one counter. And you see a Fairgrounds Trumpeter, which could get out of hand should this game go long. Yeah, it looks like we're going to see some more counter action. There's Kujar Seed Sculptor uh, potentially coming down there, PDM. Although it looks like they're looking uh, at a module in hand. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things you see about these green decks is they are, even though you have more than enough cards to build a two-color deck, sometimes enough cards to build a monocolored deck if you wanted to, uh, the green decks will very often be three colors and take the best ofs from all the cards that don't get played in some of the other decks. Oh, and there we see an animation module, a card that was just uh, played heavily in, a, uh, in our you know, main feature match, and here we see it doing its thing. Seed Sculptor puts a counter on Weldfast Monitor. He pays one. He gets a uh, servo. He attacks with the Trumpeter. This the is ripen grubs. This and is looking pretty. The ex monitor. Yeah, it's looking pretty exciting for Lithuania BDM because with all those counters, uh, Fairground Trumpeter is going to keep getting bigger. Uh, you imagine what an Armorcraft Judge would do on a board like this right now. I'm not sure whether they have one of those uh, coming their way. All right, Toru Takashita is taking eight here. Japan is on two life. And that's the hand. Japan, one of the favorites coming to this tournament, falls to 0 and 2. Team Lithuania got off to a little bit of a rocky start. They are evened up at one match, one and one here as we go into the third round of Team Sealed animation module. I love all the modules. Animation module, pretty powerful. We saw it in the feature match area. Now we see it in play here on the floor. Sending it back to you at the desk, Rich Hagan. Thanks very much to Brian David Marshall. We're going to send him in search of more magic because by my reckoning, there's still half a dozen or so matches still going here at the end of round two. So Japan are 0-2. That's a surprise, but it doesn't mean they're out of the running. Just to walk you through the structure, again, if you're just joining us, welcome along. Three rounds of Team Sealed. We go to Unified Team Modern this afternoon. Four rounds, and all 73 teams will play seven rounds today. The top 48 will advance. So Japan with work to do. Round about from here, maybe three wins, two losses would put them to three and four. That's likely to be enough. Three and four, two and five, that's probably the boundary of where that 48 slot could leave you on the outside looking in on day two. But we do have more action as promised out on the floor. BDM, where are you? What's going on? All right, I'm still in the back half of the room. Lots of stuff wrapping up over there very quickly, but in the uh, 01 bracket, I've got Team Australia versus Team England. And again, I believe this is game three. Game three of the third match of the round. And uh, you can see Team Australia with a aerial responder with a counter on it, a propeller pioneer, a thriving Ibex, a uh, seed sculptor. Uh, you see a token that's a copy of a Dakara P Fowl, a Dakara P Fowl, and a Percata Pillar Bug in play for England. Lots of mana uh, available. So this one of the classic rivalries in uh, not just world magic, but world everything. England against Australia, the old enemy, uh, as, uh, and indeed the, the friendliest of enemies. And uh, that's Graham McIntyre playing uh, for England. He's, his home base is in Nottingham right now. Um, he's very much a local uh, to me. He plays at the Chimera Game Store. Um, I'm one of the best players there for sure, alongside players like Neil Rigby, who's of course here on the coverage team, and Matt Light. Uh, Graham McIntyre very much part of that Chimera community in Nottingham. There's a riparian tiger for uh, Team Australia, Rich. So just uh, marshalling his forces there. 
Yeah, repairing Tiger's quite a bit bigger than an Aether Theorist. All right, and then passes the turn back to Australia. See if I can get a look at the life totals for you. Just a single card in hand for McIntyre right now. In blue-black, you'd like to think it was something like a tidy conclusion. He could certainly do with one against a Riparian Tiger. Team Poland and Team South Africa. Team South Africa, can you please come to the scoring table, please? So trigger on the thriving Ibex. Yeah, it's and time to attack here. Yeah, here we go. So Riparian Tiger in as the 6-6. Six, six. Aero Responder already with a counter on. Using up all his energy, sending everybody into the red zone. What is that last card in hand for England? can tell you, but I don't want to ruin the surprise. No, 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 no. I know you're right on top of them as well, so certainly don't uh, ruin the surprise. So England working through the blocks. Propeller Pioneer would be blocked. Dakara Peafowl would get in the way of the responder, the theorist would just get munched by the riparian tiger. Yeah, it, it would have tread marks. Yeah. <laughs> Teams are talking out loud about what uh, what's going to happen here. And the judges have justified just, uh, Team England that they need to play a little faster here. Uh, lots of discussion going on, sort of slowing things down. Typical of what you see as we get into the later part of each round. So just taking care of the life gain on the Bracata pillar bug there. Seven of the conduit bites the dust. Aero Responder gains some life back the other way for Australia. Takara Peafowl gets to bounce off it. Riparian Tiger was definitely the, the main thrust of that. Here's Eth Theorist for England. And still, one card in hand for Graham McIntyre. The Australian team lining up their attacks. It looks like they're going to do the same thing. Send everybody in. Yep, that responder doesn't need to uh, incur the wrath of the wrist in any way. You can just straight up, it's vigilant. So here's the English blocks again. Theorist. Eduardo Sajulic uh, jumping into the fray there to help out with the blocks. Yeah, he's the team captain, uh, currently residing in Canada. He moved there a little bit earlier this year. Uh, so who knows, we could see him playing for Canada next year, but he's been a big part of the uh, UK community for a bunch of years. It's great to see him here for his farewell tour, if you like, uh, from the England team. So in the end, a, uh, it looks like a PFAL token is getting in the way of the Tiger. Pillarbug is gonna attempt to eat the Seed Sculptor and the Aether Theorist is going to get run over by the Thriving Ibex. And again, time the judge the reminds them two. that time has just time been called in the round. Two. Time has just been called. There are only four other matches out on the floor. Just taking a look around, just seeing what else is going on. It seems to be little little pockets. You can see little pockets of uh, crowds huddled around tables. I do see that Portugal is still playing this round. Uh, and uh, Marcio Carvalho is uh, still in what I assume is game three of their third match of the round. 
Yeah, Portugal were up against Chile uh, this round uh, at 1-0. and 0. Table 18, halfway down the field, 36 matches each round this morning. One team gets the bye. In round one, that was Luxembourg. They got the free win to open their account. Um, uh, but from round two onwards, it's a team who are, are currently on zero points that will get the bye. So what worth noting, England is at, you know, one life here. Right. Yes, there was a sense that they were they were looking pretty desperate throughout most of uh, these interactions, and the fact that Australia, because uh, I mean the British blocks have seemed pretty reasonable, but Australia have just been in, in, in. England did draw a card that's going to potentially give them uh, a little bit more life here, literally and metaphorically. Hmm. Literally and metaphorically. I would have thought like it might be Appetite of the Unnatural. Well, what is that going to target? So maybe not that. Hmm. Essence extraction on go. the Seed Sculptor. So that's up to four. But still no answer for that Riparian Tiger. Just had to chump block it with a P-Foul token. Yeah, and I know you can't say it, BDM, but yeah, there it is. There's Pima Outrider um, coming along. Yeah, making a servo. And Pima Outrider, of course, has Trample. Another good draw here for England. It might not be enough, though. A tidy conclusion off the top for Graham McIntyre. Don't worry, I've walked pretty far away from the right. table to say sure, that. Sure, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's that word Trample that's going to be so difficult. You can't just, yeah, sure, you put the 2-4 in the way. So that'll take nothing. There's and the extends handshake. extends the hand, yep. Australia goes to 1-1. England falls to 0-2 here at the World Magic Cup. Sending it back to you at the desk, Rich Hagan. All right, thanks very much. And we'll get Brian David Marshall right back here as fast as his legs will carry him because we're going to get into part two of our sealed deck exercise. But more results uh, coming in for you. Uh, now, Belgium, we're up against Team USA. Now, a lot of you are fans of Team USA. Owen Turtenwald, of course, leading the team. Belgium win that one. Pascal and Peter Viren uh, in that team and Branko Neyrink amongst those. Uh, Justin Bastone is the fourth on the Belgian team. They have defeated USA, so that's the first loss for Turtenwald and Co. 2-0 to the Belgians. Uh, Scotland, meanwhile, are at 2-0. They defeated Poland. That was Gregor Kowalski, the gold level pro. Masej Janik, uh, Piotr Golgowski, uh, Glogowski rather, uh, on the Polish team. Uh, what else? Who else is at 2-0? Well, Germany, of course, you saw defeat Paulo Vita, Dama de Rosa, and the rest of the Brazilian squad, Thiago Saparito, Patrick Fernandes, uh, playing in sealed this morning for them. Bulgaria is up to 2-0. They defeated England in round one, but a big scalp in round two. It's Joel Larsson and the rest of the Swedes, Per Nystrom, part of that squad. So Bulgaria, 2-0 and China are at 2-0 and oh as well. Well, the match is still coming in. Uh, we're down to three matches left in the round, as you can see on the top left-hand corner of your screen. So why don't we get into a little more of our sealed build before the end of the last round. Simon Gertz and BDM and I took it upon ourselves to work our way through 12 boosters worth of Kaladesh, just like all the teams have. Well, now it's time for the payoff. Let's see what we were able to do with those 12 boosters. It's time for part two of Team Sealed.